Hi guys, my name's Dom, welcome back to my channel. For today's video, I'm going to be doing the first tag video on the channel. This is a good opportunity for me to recommend some specific books to you guys and maybe to get something back myself on at least one of those questions. So, which tag's it going to be? Let's stick around and find out. So, my good friend Andrew over at Andrew's Wizardly Reads recently invited me to do the Character Tropes tag. This is a series of seven questions, each representing a famous fantasy trope, and then extrapolating the theme to get, ultimately, a book or series recommendation from it. So, what I'll do is I'll list the character tropes in the description box below, so you can see what the questions are, and also so you can follow by timestamp if you prefer to skip any of these tropes. So with all that said, let's just dive straight into the questions. And the first trope is the chosen one. So this one is a book that I recommend to everyone. Now, if you know me and you've seen me around elsewhere, you probably know what book or series I'm going to pull up to recommend to you now. But you'll probably be wrong. So I've got a collection of books behind me. And the first one is Empire in Black and Gold by Adrian Tchaikovsky. Yes, I know this is not actually Empire in Black and Gold. That book is out on loan, so this is book two in the series, The Shadows of the Apt, and this is Dragonfly Falling. So what I'll do with each of these anyway is, so you can get a clearer view of the cover, rather than me waving it around in front of you, is I will put up a nice picture of the cover in this nice wall behind me. That's a bed, so I've not thrown it on the floor. So, Shadows of the Apt by Adrian Tchaikovsky. This is one of my favourite series. It's probably right up there um, in around the number two or three spot. Now, in the book itself, we're dealing with the Wasp Empire, which is the titular black and gold empire. They are moving forward, they're trying to expand, and they're looking at taking over the city-states known as the Lowlands. Within the Lowlands, we've got a university city called Collegium, and the Wasp Empire kind of has its eye on Collegium. That's kind of the jewel in the crown. It's, it's almost like a capital city, I guess. Um, and if they can take Collegium, that is a massive, really strong foothold that they will have in the Lowlands for expanding their empire. Now, one of the masters at Collegium, um, at the actual university itself, is a beetle called Stenwald Maker. He's um, kind of an ageing spy master, he's referred to. Um, and he, he knows about the wasps, he knows their threat, he's faced them before, um, but no one really believes him. They, they don't take it seriously as a threat to the lowlands. So he sends out a bunch of his students who all have their different abilities and their different skills, but he sends them out essentially as kind of trainee spies to gather intel from the front lines where on the other side of it, the Wasps have got their own agents who are laying the groundwork essentially for the vanguard of their army coming in behind them. All of the characters within the Shadows of the Apt are Insect Kingdom. Um, it's kind of the race, uh, each individual character's race. They'll be Spider Kingdom or Fly Kingdom or Beetle Kingdom. The Creepy Crawly there is the, uh, the totem insect they're referred to of the particular character and they inherit traits of their totem insects. So flies for instance have wings, they can fly, they're a bit shorter, they've got kind of this sixth sense so they can sense where danger um, is approaching from, that kind of thing. The wasps, the great enemy, they have wings as well, they can shoot a, a sting from the palm of their hand. Dragonflies, that's another winged one, so we've got various creatures or various characters who can fly. You've then got creatures like the spiders who um, kind of have this power of persuasion and they can climb like nobody's business. Anyway, each of these insect kingdom, they, they all have their own particular skills and abilities. And that's what really sets this book or this series apart from any other series. It's so, so clever. I really enjoyed reading it and seeing how all of these different characteristics are going to help kind of get our characters out of different situations. Anyway, this, this series is highly recommended. I really, really love it. Um, and if you get the opportunity, especially with the books being re-released, 
around this time. It's, it's a really good idea. It's a really great time to pick up Empire in black and gold and see what I'm going on about, basically. So question two is The Secret Air. This is a book that surprised me. So something that kind of crept up on me, I wasn't expecting really what I got from it. And that book is by Fiona McIntosh and it's called Mirren's Gift. Now, this is um, a bit of a strange book. It's um, essentially you're dealing with a character called Will who is, um, he's a general or commander at least in a king's army. The, the titular character, uh, Mirren, is a witch and she's basically being, at the start of the book, she's being executed and kind of part of his role in this particular kingdom is Will has to be there essentially and watch the executions and he kind of, as a, as a kindness, he refuses to look away. He, he feels like he would be dishonouring these people if he looks away. So he's watching as the witch Mirren is being executed. She sees that as a kindness and she offers him a gift in exchange for that. But the gift itself is that when he dies, if somebody kills Will, he will essentially swap souls with his killer. Right at the last moment, he will stay alive, essentially inheriting his killer's body. So it gives some really good opportunities for things like finding out uh, who's, who's behind an assassination plot, for instance. But all I know is I really enjoyed it. I read, uh, it's a trilogy called The Quickening. I read all three. I really enjoyed them. I thought it was quite clever. I thought it was quite well done. And uh, it's one that's just really not heard of. So um, doubly surprising in a way because no one talks about it. So if you've heard of this book or if you've uh, read Mirren's Gift or anything else by Fiona McIntosh, drop me a note down below and, uh, and share your thoughts. Question three, The Evil Overlord. This is a book that I felt was poorly executed or that fell flat. Um, and I'm actually going to use two books that follow on from each other. The first of those, book two in, I forgot what it was called then for a moment, the Lightbringer series. It's The Blinding Knife by Brent Weeks. The other book that I'm including in this is the follow-up, book three, which is The Broken Eye. Because I had the opportunity to do so on audio, I was listening to these two books whilst I was working. I thought the second book, The, um, the Blinding Knife, was okay. But that's kind of as far as I'll go. The third book in the series, The Broken Eye, I really, I really struggled with it. And I've said to a couple of people when talking about this book that if I wasn't listening to it, if I was reading this book instead, I can imagine that I would have been falling asleep at certain parts as I was reading it. I'm pretty sure I would have DNF'd the book, um, possibly even the second book, let alone the third book, if I was reading rather than listening. I just felt that I'm going to focus on the uh, the Broken Eye book three um, as the main culprit, but I just thought that the book was so slow in places. There were, I mean, we're dealing with a, essentially a magical school. Um, it's kind of magic and military mixed into, into the one. And some of the lessons that we see are great in terms of kind of the lore and explaining how the magic works and things like that, but they just went into far too much detail and really slowed down the story for me, giving lots and lots of little intricacies that I just didn't think were necessary to get the point across. The other part for me was there was one scene in particular in The Broken Eye where, as I was listening to it, it was literally just reeling off a list of names and I actually went to, I've got these on the Kindle, and I went to the ebook of The Broken Eye and I counted up and there were a hundred names, I'm not exaggerating, literally just names and colours, if you've read the books you know what that means, if you don't find out or it doesn't matter, um, but it was listing names, colours and crimes, so you get like a single line in the book for each of these and you know, you might as well have just been reading an index. It was that 
boring for me to listen to. On the one hand, if I'd have been reading this instead of listening it, listening to it, I would have just skipped to the end of the list. But on the audio, I couldn't do that. I just felt it's a perfect example for me of the question that this book or these two books just fell flat for me. I'd been quite looking forward to them and they just didn't work. And for the moment, at least, I have DNF'd the series. I might go back at some point, but it's really not a priority for me after reading or listening to these two books. So question four on this, or trope four, is The Reluctant Hero. This is a book that I'm not sure I want to read. So for the scope of this, I've chosen the books that are actually on my, as much as I have one, my TBR. Um, it's a bunch of books that I've got on my Kindle. But well, this particular one, I don't have a physical one to hold up, therefore, is Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir. Now, I've not actually heard a vast amount about this book. It seems quite a big book. I've seen various people liking it or showing it up in, in booktube videos, but I've not seen a lot of discussion about what the book's about, how good is it, what works, what doesn't work, and so forth. And I think that's kind of a large portion of what I'm unsure about when it comes to reading this book. So we're talking about necromancers here, swordswomen, um, trying to escape a life of servitude. Those are kind of some of the key elements from the blurb of this book, and it sounds absolutely fine. What's not mentioned there, though, what I found through some of my um, kind of investigation into the book is it's a bit of a mix between the fantasy and the sci-fi. We're dealing with, if I'm not mistaken, uh, different planets at various points um, and, and things like that. So I guess part of my reluctance on this is the unknown, not hearing too much about it from other people. And the other part is that kind of mix between the fantasy and the sci-fi, because if you know me, you know that there are certain things that I don't want in my fantasy. So if this is a fantasy book that incorporates some of those elements, and we're talking um, kind of a real world technology, for instance, we're talking uh, guns or other firearms. Those are the main two things, really, for me. If it incorporates those kind of things, I'm not sure that it's something that I want to read or that I will enjoy reading. Obviously, it does help if I know in advance going into it that it is kind of a sci-fi blend and it's going to have those elements because then I know it's not pure fantasy and I kind of know a little bit more what to expect even before uh, actually finding out for myself that those elements are contained. So with this one, if you've read um, Gideon the Ninth, let me know a bit more about it. Tell me whether you enjoyed it, what's good about it, what works for you. And um, at some point, I'm going to be trying it either way. So uh, let's find out, I guess. On to trope five. This one is The Lucky Novice. Quite nice and simple. This one is just a great debut. Now, there's a couple of those that uh, I've already mentioned, and there's loads that I could have picked for this one. The one that I have chosen, though, is uh, definitely, for me at least, the standout book in its particular series. It's an unfinished series dealing with some great characters, some fantastic humour that really worked for me. And it is by Scott Lynch, The Lies of Loch Lamora. This is um, it's kind of rare, I think, for the books that I've read um, in that I haven't come across any really good heist fantasy novels. Um, and this one definitely is what I would call a great heist fantasy novel. It's a bit of an unusual one in many senses. Um, a lot of fantasy, you get to see a lot of the world, and in Lies of Loch Lamora, it's more focused on a particular city, um, which is kind of a, a canal city called Camor. Um, and we're, we're dealing with this group of kind of vagabonds. They're, um, it's almost like um, Oliver and, and co, where they're um, Oliver Twist, that is, not the Disney movie, which is kind of based around that. Um, but we're dealing with kind of a bunch of urchins almost who've been taken in by this priest and he's kind of trained them up. He's a bit like the Fagin character who's trained them to be these master thieves. Rather than individuals going around on, uh, on little jobs for themselves, they are a group though. It's, um, it's a bit like Eurotians 11. That's um, one of the real 
links that I've seen for this book and I agree with. Each one adds, each of these characters adds their own set of skills so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. The book itself I thought was brilliant. It was, uh, it was great for a laugh, there's some great humour in there. The character himself of Loch Lamora has got um, a really good sense of humour that really ticks on a, on a very fine level with me. Um, so I really enjoyed it. Uh, if you're one of the people who hasn't really come across this book, if you haven't read it, I definitely recommend it. Uh, you might not like it, but uh, that's, that's what opinions are made of. Number six, we're getting to the end of them. This one is The Mentor. This is a book that was formative to my life. And there's a couple that I could have chosen for various different reasons. Um, but the one that I have gone for here is the book that I really consider is the one that was my gateway to reading fantasy for pleasure. Um, and this is uh, Simon R. Green and it's called Blue Moon Rising. This is one of the few books that I have actually reread. I'm not a big rereader of books. Um, this book was out of print, basically. I read it, um, I was talking about it years later when I was at college, and I really wanted to read it again. And then just as it happened, around that time, the book came back into print. This book is about Prince Rupert. He is the spare to the throne of the Forest Kingdom. He's He's not needed, he's not wanted, really. He's sent off on a quest to slay a dragon. So things haven't really gone for plan on this, uh, this quest, and instead of killing the dragon, Rupert's actually befriended him, and uh, he ends up coming back with the dragon in tow, and also a unicorn, and also a princess. The circumstances around the book, especially with regard to the unicorn, um, they, they play a heavy part in unleashing a essentially a plague of demons in the Forest Kingdom. Um, and Rupert and his companions uh, get heavily involved in, in fighting off these demons, basically using these legendary swords that are buried deep within this mysterious castle that he calls home. Blue Moon Rising is definitely worth a shot if you're looking for some dragons, if you're looking for some unicorns, and if you're looking for some good old fashioned good against evil, with maybe a, a little smirk or two thrown in there as well. And then trope seven, the animal companion. This one is uh, kind of two parts. I could go either way with this. It's a book that broke my heart, or it's a book that made me smile. And I changed up at the last moment. I was going with the book that made me smile because there are various books that I've read that are sad, but I don't think any of them I'd go so far as to say as, as broke my heart. Probably the closest I've got, though, is the one that I've chosen to answer this prompt. And this is where we go back to what you're expecting for question one, if you know me. This is Ruin, book number three in The Faithful and the Fallen by John Gwynne. This one I will be a bit more careful with. This one is kind of the if you know, you know circumstance. The if, if you're not familiar with The Faithful and Fallen, the books really follow on from each other. It's four books which are essentially, the way I see them, written as one and split neatly into four volumes. So the end of one book is basically the starting point of the next book. They're hours, maybe a day after the book finishes, the next one starts. That's a really good thing in this instance because as I said, if you know, you know, but it's been said around uh, Booktube, uh, around the community before that, this book is called Ruin for a reason. It will ruin you. And I have known people who have literally been in tears, not wanted to continue because they cannot bear any more heartbreak from what has happened here. You'll notice that I'm being very vague uh, with this because obviously it's, it's book three and it's towards the end of a book. Um, and I'm not going to give spoilers for it, but um, it is absolutely well worth it. It is worth pushing on uh, through the heartbreak and the pain and getting into book four and finishing the series off. I would always say that anyway, but specifically in relation to this particular thing that we're talking about without talking about it. Um, it's 
it's just one more thing that these books are absolutely amazing for. John Gwynne does a fantastic job with these. He really pulls at the heart strings on so many different occasions. It's almost, um, it's almost like it doesn't matter who your favourite character or characters are in these books. There will be a moment at some point where you will fear for their lives and you'll be elated that something's happened and you'll be crushed. It's an absolute roller coaster of emotions and it's one of the reasons that I really, really love these books. So that's it then, seven questions or seven tropes and seven books or series recommended and hopefully maybe a recommendation for me as far as Gideon the Ninth goes. So have you read any of these books or series? Let me know in the comments below and tell me if you agree or disagree or what your thoughts overall were. And especially for Gideon, give me some information so I can prepare myself before I go into reading that particular book. The last thing for me to do is to tag a couple of people to follow on and to do the character tropes video for themselves. So the first tag is, is actually um, another British fantasy booktube. This is Overly Average Ben. If you haven't seen his channel, I'll drop a link in the description box below, but make your way over there, subscribe to him and see his future content as he comes out. This is a guy who's got a great sense of humour, so I really click with his videos. Um, he's got a similar kind of humour to what I have, even if I don't quite display in my videos nearly as much as he does. Um, but uh, yeah, the name is maybe wrong, I'd say he's above average, Ben. Go and find out for yourselves though and give him a subscribe as well. And the second person I'm going to tag is Megan from Megan's Reading Revelations. Megan, you kind of got me into this, so uh, here's a little bit back at you. If you don't know Megan, again, I'll drop a link to her channel in the description box below. Go check her out, watch some videos and subscribe for her content. She releases uh, around about three, sometimes more times a week. So you can get some really good content on fantasy, sci-fi, classics and more from her channel. Megan's the kind of person who can really make you smile when you need a lift. She's got boundless energy, she's always smiling and it's infectious, so thank you very much for that, Megan. So that's it from me today anyway. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this and you picked up some good book recommendations. As usual, hit the like and subscribe buttons below this video and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one. For now, take care though. Bye bye.